weekly weekly uh, community building call let's call it that it really came about because tito and i were planning to do some his training in uganda earlier this year and then both of us were unable to travel and without I, this might be a better format anyway to have a kind of weekly series of meetings so the idea being that um we can touch base regularly together once a week. People might not make it every week. It's really important that um, you grab the link that Tito has given there, um, plug your name in on the attendance section of the, of the notes. Reason being is you know, when we look back at the end of the year and we see how many people have been attending meetings, will help us decide whether it was a good idea, whether we should go forward with it or not. So please grab the link down there. Tito has put it in the chat and put your name on the attendance. I see nobody has done so yet. See who's going to be first. So we took a little bit more. Uh, we'll leave ourselves 10 minutes at the end to talk about some some topics of the kind of things we might be talking about in these in these meetings um, I share the link again? But for now okay the link maybe people who are joining late maybe don't get the link let me share it let it, let me share. So, One of the exciting things about today is that uh, many of you know me, I think, but um, I've not yet met Tito. So today you're going to meet him. Tito is basically taken over the role of shepherding this server admin community um, from me. I will be Tito's sidekick from now on. He'll be hosting the meetings. I like to think of it as... Tito will be the new the new Joe Rogan of server admin with a weekly call of interesting items. Um, besides Tito, some of you know we've got um, Danny from Solid Lines working with us part time as, as well. Um, but Tito is glad you're going to be leading the group. What he's going to be talking about today will be his conversion of all my horrible bash scripts. Many of you are familiar with my horrible bash scripts, which, which um, people have used for, for doing quick setup and maintenance of their DHIS2 installations. It's good to see Stephen on the call. Stephen actually contributed quite a bit to those early scripts. Um, Tito's converted all those into Ansible playbooks, which is something we've been meaning to do for a long time. Um, he's going to introduce a little bit of that today, but I think we'll have lots of opportunity in the weeks ahead to dig into some of those. Um, then we want to leave ourselves at least, at least 10 minutes at the end that we can have a little bit of a um, round table about different kind of topics that we might discuss in future meetings. So guys, that's it from me. Um, Tito, can I hand over to you now and forever? Um, you can introduce yourself a little bit and maybe jump into what you're going to show us today about Ansible tooling. Thank you. Thank uh, welcome, everybody. welcome everybody who's made the call and thanks for filling in the attendance and spread the word and let's keep the ball rolling. Okay, Tito, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Bob, to the team. So um, my name is Tito um, uh, Kip Kurgat, and um, I'm based uh, in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, I'm taking over from Bob uh, on matters system administration. Um, but uh, yes, uh, I think uh, he's going to be available maybe uh, for the guidance, but most of the duties, responsibilities, I'll be taking uh, over uh, on the um, system admin community. 
So yeah, well, I have uh, close to one year right now uh, in uh, DHS2 uh, University of Oslo. Um, and when I joined, um, yes, we had um, a way that uh, people used to do installation of uh, uh, an automated way where we people would use to um, to install DHS2 in their environments. Those are the Bob's uh, bash scripts, which uh, kind of make things easier a bit uh, when you do uh, deploy DHS2 and its components uh, into into a server. Well, um, one of the main reason why, or, or the reason why I got in is to at least uh, support uh, the scripts and also figure out uh, the better, a better way of uh, deploying the HS2, not with, um, with uh, bash scripts or use Ansible for that matter. And uh, I prepared a few uh, slides uh, that are going to at least um, explain the rationale why we, we, we are hoping to get to bash scripts, uh, get uh, to Ansible scripts uh, and uh, do away with the uh, bash scripts. But I, I'm not uh, like entirely replacing bash scripts. There are uh, some other tasks that you cannot, uh, or Ansible is not going to handle best, like even backups. Backups um, would need uh, a script that might uh, or, or run uh, from the from the background. And again, you cannot use Ansible to run bash, uh, you know, to do backup because at the end of the day, Ansible would need say SSH or LXD to connect to your database, and if that happens. Then me, that means that you need to really have a very good connection and uh, for you to run a backup and, and a backup, uh, a very good backup, uh, or if you have a very huge database, might take not even, uh, uh, or rather more than 30 minutes, you know, and uh, having a tunnel up or rather SSH running all that time might be a challenge, say if you have not good uh, internet connection. That is why, <clears throat> For issues backups, we will stick with uh, bash scripts and even other other things. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to do a presentation. Uh, that will give us a brief overview of uh, how Ansible comes into the, um, the old world of uh, deploying DHIS2. So this is the... <coughs> The, um, the slides. And I'm going to explain uh, a bit about um, Ansible and how we are going to use Ansible uh, to deploy in future DHS2 uh, application. And uh, once more, give uh, a few demos on, on why, uh, or, or explain and demonstrate the rationale why we are using Ansible. So um, traditionally, um, DHS2 uh, can be can be deployed manually, and with that, uh, it's a web-based Java application, and um, you need uh, to just uh, get the components running. One is the Java application, which is running, of course, uh, on top of Tomcat, and then uh, it needs to at least uh, connect to a database, which is Postgres in our case. That means you need to again install Postgres database, and then um, integrates your app that is a Tomcat application with the, with the same database. That means you're going to create um, manually database user uh, and, and a, a database and, um, and the password. And then those details you get to the DHS2 application, and then it will be able to communicate back to the, to the database, of course, when the app is running. Again, you need to deploy uh, other components like uh, proxy, because at the end of the day, you don't, you don't want your, your Tomcat application be hit directly from the internet. You want it to be uh, hiding behind uh, some proxy. In our case, we are using uh, either Apache 2 or um, Nginx, and that also you need to, do it manually and traditionally, somehow you get to install the, the application and then uh, 
do SSL offloading. Of course, our DHIS2 application is not doing SSL stuff. Well, it can do. Uh, uh, theoretically, you can just uh, do uh, SSL stuff on the on top of Tomcat, but not uh, the way we are doing our stuff. We are doing SSL uh, termination on the on the proxy, and then after that, well, at the end of the day, you need to. Uh, do configuration file on either Nginx or Apache 2, proxy forwarding at the end of the day, all your requests after SSL stuff is done to the, to the backend application, which is in our case, Tomcat. Yeah, and that those are the core components of DHS2, but at the end of the day, in a very good uh, env uh, production environment, you won't miss uh, monitoring. So you would, you would also need to deploy monitoring on top of your, of your core components. So, that uh, alone would take a lot of time uh, for you to kind of have every uh, all those components set up and all integrated so that they can all work together. It will take a lot of your time. And if say you have you want another instance, uh, again you have to repeat the whole process and get another instance up and running. So. Um, so that is that was manual installation. Well, there are documents that um, or documentation about the same or on how you could do DHS2 uh, installation uh, step by step. Uh, and as as I have mentioned, it will take um, time for you to at least one have one uh, instance up and running, and it can it's prone to errors also because you do interact directly with with the system. It's very prone to errors. And also, uh, it may you may you may or not adhere to the best security practices when you do manual installation because at the end of the day, you will have to do permissions yourself. You'll have to you know uh, ensure that Tomcat user is created, and at the same time, all those files for Tomcat applications are owned by that user. You know all those security considerations. You have to do it manually. And most of the time, you'll find uh, people forgetting those uh, those best practices when they do manual installation. And you you would go to an extra mile of even creating uh, uh, system D files for your app, you know. And and sometimes people would deploy application that that has uh, or doesn't have those uh, system D files, so that whenever your server does a reboot, you have to do manual. Uh, you have to get your application up manually. So, and there we go. Uh, uh, we we went route of automating stuff. Well, there are, there are scripts um, developed uh, by the team and Bob. Uh, those are um, bash scripts. They do the job well. They do the the the, the installation of DHS two perfectly well, and it gets all those components uh, up and running. Uh, you don't have to worry that how to you would in integrate say proxy dhis2 application which is the um, uh, the compute part of of, of uh, your your stack and then the database you don't need to worry about the end to end uh, communication it will just happen uh, with the bash scripts because at the end of the day it does uh, create your config files and um, and then at the end of uh, at the end of it all you will just have to access um the url that you supplied on the um, on the variables that you, you you declared before the installation and you'll have the app up and running of course you'll do a few uh tweaks maybe for optimization for the application and also the database but um from the fly you'll have your your instance up and running and you'll be able to access the, um, the data i mean sorry the app from the web Yes. So, but but then the bash scripts um, is is there, but it has a few challenges. One is, uh, say you have an infrastructure on which um, database is sitting on its own server, um, uh, application is sitting on a separate server, and even monitoring server is different. I mean, all those components are separated; they are not running from within one host. Then you need to figure figure out a way you would um, have um, the apps deployed, you know, um, uh, on those components running on different servers. And the way bash scripts work is 
you would have to be sitting on, on the server where you're doing deployment and then uh, run the script from within that server. That would uh, ideally, or rather practically de deploy the application from within that host only. That means it's not going to, it's not supporting uh, that environment that I talked about when where you have um, components running on their separate servers. And um, yes, so <clears throat> I think, I, I guess we've talked about this. So um, to eliminate that is when we, 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 we opt to, we, we are opting for Ansible because with Ansible, you can um, use other connection methods. You don't need to really, um, uh, you don't need, you, you're not confined to running your script from within the host only. You can use SSH as a, a connection, uh, underlying connection uh, protocol, where you just need to have a deployment server. And then um, from the deployment server, you, you get to run script remotely over SSH. Yeah, so that uh, you would have tasks that are related to, to say DHIS2 application deploying Tomcat, and uh, you have those tasks grouped into a role, and then it will uh, deploy um, DHIS2 application on, on, on the application instance. And then all the tasks that are related to database are grouped into a different role, and they will deploy a Postgres database on Postgres server, and at the end of the day, do the, um, do the, um, do the integration between the two. So with Ansible, you are able to achieve that. And Ansible has um, more than 15 connection, um, more than 15 connection modules. One of them is LXD. That is when you want to deploy um, uh, DHIS2 within one host and you're using LXD containers, then you can just connect to those LXD containers with uh, LXD module. And uh, another one is SSH. That is when you want to, um connect to the to the components the server components separately with ssh and deploy data to on those uh components um and, and even database and monitoring separately you could also connect with docker that is when you're deploying dhs to um docker containers you're not limited to either using uh, lxd or um or SSH, you can also do Docker and, 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 and even more uh, connection uh, modules are supported. Yeah, so automation basically uh, means that uh, we, we, don't, we don't interact ourselves more with the installation process, it's automated and we, 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 we will not have, um, uh, or we will eliminate, eliminate if not uh, do away with all the errors that normally happen when, when doing manual installation. And then when you want to deploy new DHIS2 application, you just need to run a playbook or rather a bash script and it will do it in a, in a fly. So yeah, that means it, you're gonna spend very, very little time doing the deployment process. Yeah, so the two deployment um, automation approaches that we have right now is uh, bash scripts that legacy, legacy uh, bash scripts that we've been using all along. And then we have uh, DHIS2 server tools, which uh, I developed. And then um, these ones now are using Ansible. And right now they support two connection, uh, connection uh, modules, rather via yeah, plugins, that is SSH and LXD. So that means you can have DHIS2 running on a single server and you'll be using LXD connection plugin. You just need to uh, declare that and it will set up DHS2 uh, and all its components within uh, one server using LXD plugin. And if you want to, if you go to an environment where DHS2 is, uh, the, the components and the application stack are spread uh, over virtual machines or physical servers, then you don't need to worry. As long as you have network connectivity between all these um, components that you just need to have one uh, or rather a small deployment server where you have Ansible and then you set your, your, um, your deployment, uh, your connection in, uh, to SSH. Of course, prior to that, you need to make sure that you have at least SSH connection to those uh, hosts that you're going to be, uh, you will be deploying DHIS2 into. Um, yeah. So yeah, I've also explained why we, we want to 
get to Ansible entirely and avoid using bash scripts. And one of, of the reasons is because with multiple connections, we can support multiple uh, architectures. And uh, of course, also there's impotency. That means Ansible, uh, whenever you run a task and then you repeat the same playbook again, it will not do nothing. It will just um, tick that that is already done and you don't need to do anything. It will just be skipped. Uh, those tasks are going to be skipped. So yeah, so it is very important and that is uh, a, a very good feature because you're not going to have undesired effects when you do repeat your playbook. It will just uh, do nothing. So when, when, when you do deployment once, you don't have to worry about what, what, what will happen when you do repeat running your playbook, okay? And um, I'm going to do uh, a quick demo on the, on the, on the, on, on a quick demo on the connections that are supported uh, by Ansible and then also say demonstrates um, the interpotency with Ansible. So I'm going to switch to terminal. Yeah. <clears throat> so I have a server here um, that it's fresh. It's running Ubuntu 2204 this, uh, with this IP address. Yeah, so I'm going to connect into it via SSH. Um, yeah. And then we're going to check the, um, the SSH uh, files, for instance, SSH uh, D file for, for, for just for example. Yeah. Let me ping, be sure that the server is reachable from here. Okay. Yeah, LXC list. So it's just another LXD container. I'm just using um, as a server and I want to ping it from my laptop. This server is sitting elsewhere and I am able to reach. I'm accessing it via uh, VPN. Um, so I'm going to SSH into this server and um, check uh, SSHD configuration file. So I'm going to edit. SSD config. And this is the, 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 the uh, at least the default configurations that you get when, um, when you do install um, a, a fresh Ubuntu server and uh, of course enabled SSH. So it doesn't have much. It has uh, lots of the basic, say port 22 for SSH and and with this, uh, even uh, password authentication is at least no, but then I might, uh, let me just change it to yes. And then uh, I will run later on as Ansible script to, to change that. That uh, the Ansible script is supposed to have an SSH for instance. Yes. And then, um, yeah. So it's very fresh config, config file. It, it doesn't have, it, it has defaults. At least I've changed them the authentication to allow password authentication but then i'll run as uh, my ansible script and see and we can watch together what it ha it's happening so i'm going to run um ansible also from my from my laptop ansible uh playbook and then um of course the playbook i want to run is uh to set up and then um i'm going to put the host which I want to run uh, my playbook against. And the host is this, it has this IP address. It has uh, .179 as its IP address. So you put uh, its IP address there. And then, um, yeah. And then with uh, minus K, you would be prompted for a pseudo password because at the end of the day, um, as much as Ansible is connecting uh, via SSH to the remote host, you need and you need to do tasks that requires elevation. It requires sudo. Then you need to instruct Ansible at least to um, to be able to run elevated privileges remotely. And of course, 
remote server has pseudo password. So with minus K, it enables you to, to supply that pseudo password, which will be used at least to do uh, elevated privileges on the on the remote server. So this playbook, uh, tool setup uh, .yaml, has um, as a search optimization um, uh, tasks, and I'm going to run it. And then I'm going to repeat. So this minus K is going to ask, uh, it's going to prompt for the, for the PCAM password. So it has to be minus I, not minus L. Minus L is for limiting, but just minus I. Yeah, so this is now running um, all the tasks uh, on that playbook, and it will um, at least show you what's happening in the scenes. And uh, read the, we have an error through the password. I didn't type it well. Let's repeat and see. Yeah, so, so the password is correct. So first task is gathering facts. Normally Ansible, when you run and you don't uh, instruct it to not gather facts, then it will it will gather facts about the, 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 the OS that you're running against. And facts are, are actually meta, metadata about the the OS or rather the server to, that you are running playbook against. For instance, in our case, if it's an Ubuntu, then it will catch the um, OS release and all even the, the gateway IP address and all uh, the metadata about that server. There are a lot of information here. So, but you can then you can turn off that if you don't want. So now it's running the, um, the tasks. And um, those tasks are actually disabling. Um, I mean, adding SSH to make sure that it meets um, at least the, the best security um, um, settings. And uh, see the first task is disabling weak uh, key exchange algorithms and enabling strict symmetric uh, key ciphers and configuring secure message authentication algorithms, you know. So this task, um, it checks actually really the configuration files that Ansible, uh, sorry, that SSH has and it, it, it's changing um, if it's not meet, meeting the, the top security, like this one now here, password authentication, it's being set to no, because I had set it to yes when, when I accessed that server. So it's now reverting to no, and even other, other, um, other lines are being changed right now. So when this finishes and we check the configuration file on this server, it will have changed. It will, it will have changed a lot. Yeah, so this this uh, playbook is now finished, and we can check the, um, the configuration file once more and see what's changed. Now you see the configuration file has a lot of changes. Uh, this one was not there before. We have it now that only authentication method allowed is public key. And if you go to the very beginning, you see that um, uh, <clears throat> this host key parameters that you see and commented here, these four lines here, or even five, they were added and, and they're, they're, they're actually making secure, making SSH more secure and even um, making the FABOS level, I mean, the log level into, uh, into FABOS and disabling root log login, for instance, and um, enabling only public key authentication or setting it to yes. And even disabling password authentication, which we had set to yes, just for demonstration and, um, and even down here, you notice that there are other lines that were added. So upon running this script once more, by Ansible Playbook once more, I hope I've done uh, correct to the password. You will notice that nothing will be will, will happen this time around because all those changes that are declared on them, on them on the on the task are done already so it will not do anything you're seeing this now that disabling weak um, key exchange algorithms is green green means it's not doing anything uh, and everything that happens now this time round will just be green 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 because um that now explains the the intempotency of ansible that it will not repeat the same thing one once it's uh, it's it's done already yeah, so that that explains. You know, you can have to watch your 
time a little bit if we're going to leave 10 minutes at the end. Okay. So that explains the, the, the intent contency. So, yeah. And then we want to check also Ansible connection supported. So you notice that all that happens here will, will, will just be green, green, green. It will not change anything. And this is a desired characteristic of, um, of Ansible that once you run your playbook and some changes are made, you don't need to, when you run it again, it will just uh, do nothing. Uh, and we want that also during our, our DHS2 deployment. Yeah. So let me demonstrate the connection feature. Let me, let me wait for this to finish, then I'll demonstrate that also. But at the end of the day, right now, any, everything that happens here is through SSH. It's happening via SSH connection. This server, as I mentioned, is sitting somewhere else. It's not within uh, a VM here. It's even uh, some other building. And connection to that server is with SSH using uh, at least uh, public private key um, authentication. So if I do Ansible um, docs, oh, let me see, Ansible, and then uh, docs, and check, I mean, at least the type connection, the number of connections that we they are supported. You notice that there are many, there are many, and uh, we are focusing on SSH and at least LXD here somewhere here. Yeah, here is LXD. So these are the two connections that we are using right now. But you can even explore LXC because with LXC connection, you can also connect to, to your containers. There's also Docker, Docker connection and even these other connections that we are not using. You can use uh, Ansible to connect to LXC and even KMU, you know, all these connection protocols are supported. Um, yeah, so Ansible, let me just run an ad hoc command. Ansible, and then uh, I want to connect to. I want to connect to this server over SSH. This server over SSH. And just ping. Ping is just uh, used for testing connectivity. Okay, that is used to test test cost connectivity. And um, the module I'm running is ping, just to test if I'm able to connect to this server here, using. Um, using Ansible ad hoc command. And this means that I'm able to connect to that server with SSH, of course. I could fabose and, and check connection, connection used under the, under the hood, for instance. And you'll notice that it's using, at the end of the day, SSH connection, and it's using my username, uh, KT, to, to connect to that server. And it's able to connect, and it's able to ping, yeah? Yeah. So when I am sitting within this server, um, and, and uh, of course, LXC containers are running here, I could also run the same um, ad hoc command from within the server. Um, but now this time around, I want to, to use um, LXC connection. Um, and this, for LXC connection, you just connect with them, with, with, them, with the containers name not even the IP address. Let's just connect to the container's name, server admin, and, 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 and then use environment variables where you set your force connection really to be LXD and not defaulting to SSH. Because SSH at the end of the day is a default connection. So we can connect to that and do a ping and see what happens. It's also successful, it's success. And we can check uh, really and prove that uh, LXD was used under the hood. And this is going to show us that uh, we, uh, with a little far boss, we're going to check and, and be sure that really the connection used was LXD. You can also use Docker and all those connections that were, were that I, I did, uh, I showed back here. Yeah. So, so I've demonstrated Ansible's ability for, um, for the, um, for in potency and also that it can support even SSH and LXD connection. So maybe I can just show you the structure of my Ansible script, uh, HS2 scripts. And uh, yeah, it has this uh, structure. We have uh, two directories, 
deploy and then docs directory. Of course, this is in GitHub already. And we want to have documentation and how to documents within this folder. And then uh, the code of the Ansible script within the deploy folder. And then readme, of course, is on the top of the directory where it gives us um, uh, at least um, at least um, how you could install uh, or follow that through the, the installation process. Yeah, okay. So within the deploys, within the deploy script, uh, deploy folder, we have uh, Ansible playbook and also the roles. So the main playbook that we normally uh, run is dhis2.yaml. Uh, let me just edit and see, display the same. It has a few roles. It has um, Postgres. This, these are roles that are related to Postgres database, deploying uh, Postgres within either an LXD container or within uh, a server uh, sitting somewhere else and access is over, the, uh, over SSH. We have DHIS2. This is really focused on uh, deploying uh, DHIS2 application either on, on a standalone server or within the um, LXD container. And this is proxy, which, which can be Nginx or Apache 2 and also monitoring. Uh, monitoring is for the, for the Munin, for general server monitoring, and also even application monitoring with um, Glorut. Yeah, so this is the basic structure. So at the end of the day, it reads variables somewhere, and those variables are in inventory, inventory host uh, file. Uh, and uh, on inventory host file, uh, I just edit, and uh, this is where you can declare the type of connection that you want to use, either LXD or SSH. In case you have your server scattered everywhere and you have access with the network, with the IP address, then you would set this to SSH. That way it will connect to those servers with SSH and deploy your DHS2. And, and a few other configuration parameters like SSL type that you want to use. You might have your SSL, um certificate with with you or you want to get that with a let encrypt and even time zone and the network that you want to at least be using so this this is the configuration file that have all all those uh together uh, within one uh, one file of course there are other ways that you could declare your variables with ansible there are a ton of ways that you could declare your variables right now we are using these and these scripts are being improved with uh they're actively actually developed and we keep improving every every time, yeah. I think I, up to that point, uh, I have um, done a couple of in introduction with Ansible and even our tools, yes. So uh, we have roles done or written into this uh, directory. They're all grouped into this uh, roles directory. If you go to, into that directory and list the contents, then you have DHIS2, firewall, integration, and even monitoring and Postgres um, directories. Those are hosting uh, raw scripts, or rather uh, scripts that deploy those applications. Let's just check one script for um, deploying DHIS2. It's within um, DHIS2 folder, uh, TAS, and then um, within that, you have so many tasks, but you can see this one, or this only, only this one. And this one have um, YAML scripts. These are now uh, with Ansible. And you see it's somehow uh, has description, the comments, and this one, one comment is, for instance, setting up um, um, Tomcat and Java, you know. It's installing at the end of the day, uh, Jerry and Unzip and Tomcat 9 and Tomcat 9 admin. So it's just like the basic way that you would use to install um, application or rather package with apt. Uh, but this now you're using apt module because uh, Antibol have a, a ton of modules that you could use instead of, yeah, you could run a raw command here, but you you can take make use of apt module for the interpotence and even other benefits. and. <clears throat> And, and, and install those packages with this uh, single um, single task. And then all the other tasks that are relating to DHIS2 will now come until the end. And even uh, like this one, very last one here is getting the WAV file. You can get the WAV file from either a file or from the, from the internet where we normally host our WAV files. Yeah. 
So yes, so I think we can now go back to the last section of the agenda, unless there's a question. Yes, Kito, can I come in? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, that's a great job uh, that you have done and uh, uh, looks more interesting to try and uh, find out uh, uh, maybe which area to improve and uh, things like that. Of course, uh, it's good that uh, uh, you have come with another initiative to have multiple alternative if for somebody if wants it to, uh, to install DHS to which uh, script to use. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, we have been using Bash, uh, as you said before, and then uh, coming to this Ansible uh, look more uh, a bit interesting. So I think you will try, try it and uh, try to come up and maybe the next time we meet, we might have some, uh, some feedback maybe to share or so uh, where the area to improve and uh, things like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes, yeah, in, in even sessions that comes uh, uh, after today is, I would even demonstrate that they all, um, the, the all installation with Ansible. I mean, like in a, in a, in a session, uh, do installation from scratch, uh, either using LXD uh, connection and deploy our apps uh, within the single uh, server uh, with all of us watching. And with all of us um, on call, we share screen and then we run and see all the tasks that uh, happens uh, behind the scenes, and then also discuss more about it. Uh, of course, another session we can even schedule um, connection with SSH, set up, uh, say, virtual machines, and try from a deployment server deploy DHS2 using SSH connection to those servers. Uh, yeah, and have uh, a few questions from you and even discuss more about that. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. If, if if as many people as possible get the chance to just try them out during the week, then yeah, maybe next week, Tito, maybe you can do a kind of end-to-end -end installation, but also let's let's deal with feedback and questions and suggestions for improvements. Yeah. From the people. Yes. Moses was was worried that maybe the setup of Ansible is a little bit complicated. No, no. Um, well, uh, from the readme, let me just get to the readme file. It has to uh, server tools. It's I know what I was talking to Michael, I think last month, because it's not so much that the setup of Ansible is complicated, but the whole layout of Ansible scripts can be a little bit intimidating to, to start with. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, you've done a good job here of describing the setup. It's not so bad. Yeah. So with these few commands here, you can you can at least have Ansible set up on the, the server. You just need to run them and that will get Ansible uh, platform uh, installed. And then from there, uh, the only thing required now for, for you is to run the script using the installed Ansible. Yeah. Of course, there are other packages like uh, Python net address that will be required before you start installation. But then this will get, we take care of that. Yeah, I think. I can yeah. confirm that I was uh, successfully able to set up everything with Ansible just from scratch. No preparation before. Uh, there were some minor packages missing and uh, I've added them successfully, but it was done on the pure like the Ubuntu setup without any extra packages in the system. So the documentation is sufficient to make it happen. Thanks, Michael. Good to hear you. Maybe just for the purpose of other people on the call who haven't met you. Michael is our, our security boss. Um, one of the things that he's doing is he's going to use these Ansible scripts as a, as a sort of security reference configuration. So um, everything that we recommend in terms of security compliance to, to whatever controls we, we, we think are suitable, all of that should be should be um, um, 
yeah, the reference implementation should should implement all of those all of those controls. So it's a good thing to watch, and maybe we'll we'll get a chance to interview Michael one of these one of these weeks about some of that work. Yes. So uh, I just wanted to add that like uh, our idealistic and probably achievable goal is to set uh, an environment where or to configure the environment where we can safely deploy a DHS to a system which is secure by default. And uh, the scripts are already doing a lot of the work for that. So the configuration was thoroughly done to ensure that we have important security components all proper configuration for SSH and other things done from in, by default. And uh, we will be assessing uh, this reference setup on our test platform. So uh, in, in a kind of, in, I hope that in the near future we'll be able to say that once you use these tools and install the system without any extra addition, it will be, or changes, it will be uh, a reasonably secure by default. This is a kind of a super goal for us. Yeah, 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 I agree. And, and the beauty of the scripts, uh, Ansible script, is that you, you can now, you know, improve with time uh, to, to suit your security um, requirements. And say you want to fix some permission to, uh, of a file that you do deploy, you can just, uh, with time, change that. And, and, and at the end of the day, the end goal is to make sure that whatever the scripts do deploy meets uh, the best security standards. Yeah. Okay, so but, but maybe without getting too far into the love fest of the beauty of your scripts, Tito, let's see if we get a little bit of feedback from people. I know this is the very first call that we've done, um, and we've got an idea where next week we'll go ahead and you'll continue with doing the full setup. But I listed down a whole lot of possible topics in that agenda item four. I'd be interested to hear from people What's their kind of priority interest? What kind of things would they like to be talking about? Yeah. Any suggestions? As a, uh, one of the things we can do, so it's not so boring, is we can find interesting people to talk to. So we'd get Michael on one of these weeks. We can talk to maybe the, the infrastructure team in, in, in Oslo. We could talk to different implementers out there, HISP South Africa, BAO, just get interesting people on and lots of tutorial sessions. But please, anyone, what's their thinking about topics? Is, is the weekly call a good idea? Yeah, it's a good idea. It's a bit of a commitment for everyone on a Thursday morning. And maybe suggestions on maybe other topics that you would need us to talk about. Uh, hello, hello, uh, Tito. Yes. Yes, I, I think uh, most of the time we have been focusing on uh, uh, installing this DHS too, especially when we are uh, we are online, connect to the internet, but. Uh, uh, with the, my experience uh, visiting to Eritrea, it's uh, just another uh, situation that where uh, it's totally offline and uh, it's somehow very hard to install DHS2 uh, online, uh, offline, uh, where you might also need to uh, to gather doing this virtual thing and uh, carry out the, that visualization that you have created while online to the, to the offline site. Maybe we can... Uh, we can find a way how uh, we can uh, we can find a way uh, to to do this kind of uh, DHS two installation uh, offline. So this is script that we are creating or we have been using uh, works fine when we are online. But what if it's offline? Uh, how is it going to work? Maybe we can have some little exploration on that. Yes, that's a good point. Hmm. Well, because uh, the scripts, at the end of the day, when you're doing, uh, say, for instance, installing uh, Postgres, you're pulling it from the official 
PostgreSQL well, repositories, or even when you're installing Tomcat, you don't get the file, and then you know you don't you're not doing it from a file. You just get the 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 files from from the internet. So there are situations really when um, when internet is locked and you don't have access to any 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 server outside there, and you want to deploy DHS too. That way you get your packages and 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 ideally you need to get them into the server say via SSH and then um, have uh, DHS2 running. So you, it's kind of manual setup with without internet where you put your packages and put it the right place and then you start Postgres with those, you know, yeah, bin files. Yeah, I think the way I would probably approach that is to is to assemble my travel kit before I left. Um, maybe set up a, a a kind of a local local apt repository um, with all the packages that I've freshened up before I've left, taken on my my portable hard drive or USB stick or what have you. Stephen, you've done quite a lot of installations of odd software in odd places. Um, what's yeah, your... including Eritrea. Hi, it's Stephen here. Uh, yeah. It's exactly what you said, Bob. I, I tend to, when I've done it in difficult places, put together my uh, my kit, as it were, and, and bring it along. And in the past, sort of before Linux containers happened, I was a fan of uh, using tools like VMware, which are more commercial, but they offer you the ability to, you know, relatively easy, just grab an entire virtual machine and, and dump it onto a hard disk and just bring it along with you and just redeploy it. These days, I mean, with containers, the other neat thing you can do with either LXC containers natively in Ubuntu, um, or, you know, if you use a tool like Proxmox, which makes LXC containers have a nice, you know, web UI and all that, it, you know, it's a right click backup, and then you just have the whole container, and then you just, you just take the container with you. I mean, the nice thing these days is disk space is cheap, you know, so it's pretty easy to, to carry things along. Um, a great presentation, by the way. I, I really welcome seeing people using, starting to use Ansible, and I, I, I make a lot of use of it as well. And if anybody ever wants to have a, a further talk on this meeting, uh, covering topics like, you know, going a little bit further with with uh, Ansible about maybe how to deploy in an environment where you have other things running. Uh, if anybody's interested in in tools like Telegraph or um, InfluxDB, how it might be integrated in to monitor things like DHS2 love to love to share um also I, I i do something similar when i deploy dhis2 but i actually make use of the uh, the oslo docker images because i find docker really really useful so i actually deploy different docker containers using ansible if anybody's interested in that love to share there so thanks yeah Stephen, we'll put you on our list of interesting people to interview okay <laughs> I think it's great that you're having this meeting as well, too. I think uh, these face-to-face -face type discussions are fantastic. Yeah, I think we can, our time is up. Can wrap, wrap up today and then, uh, yeah. Uh, feel free to add uh, more topics that uh, we can discuss more about maybe next week and even subsequent calls. It's 13 hours. Cool. Thanks, Tito. I got to get on to another call. So see you all next week. Bye. Okay, thank you very much. That's it.